This is uh, uh, the history of 19th century uh, banking in one hour, <laughs> is, uh, is a topic. I was given this topic because I've written a lot about this in, in, uh, in parts of several books and in a, c a couple of journal articles. And so I'm going to give it a try. It, it's uh, uh, one thing that uh, makes it kind of relevant is uh, just last week, uh, I think the last week or the week before, when um, uh, Ron Paul quizzed Bernanke at the House Financial Services Committee hearing, uh, uh, one of the comments that um, the Fed chairman made was that uh, the Fed uh, was an, um, supposedly an improvement on the unregulated banking system of the 19th century. And, uh, and that was a, a statement of shocking ignorance from someone who claims to be an economic historian. That, that's what Bernanke's claim to fame was in academe when he was a Princeton professor, his economic history. He claims to be a, uh, an expert in the history of the Great Depression. And uh, as I told a guy I met at a bar who found out I was an economist, I told him that Bernanke is a, an expert in an incorrect history, theory of the Great Depression. <laughs> and uh, uh, so you, know, you can be a, an expert in the theory that the Earth is flat uh, you know, there, there were, used to be a lot of experts on that, and, and that's sort of what Ben Bernanke is. But it's just, just shocking ignorance for him to say, uh, either that or he was just purposely lying, uh, to say that there was an unregulated banking system in the 19th century. That, it, that was never true. Uh, there wasn't a Fed, but there was all, uh, lots of government intervention. And so I'm going to start at the beginning. At the beginning of the American Republic, this is the late 18th century, uh, as soon as the American Revolution was over, uh, there was a, a political uh, cabal in America that essentially wanted to tr uh, adopt the British mercantilist system in America. And uh, what was this system? It was a system, uh, it was known as mercantilism in Britain and elsewhere in Europe. And it was a system of uh, subsidies, direct and indirect, to politically connected businesses uh, a system of protectionism, protectionist tariffs, and it was a system that was financed in part by the Bank of England, a central uh, a government-connected bank. And so uh, after the revolution was over, uh, there were a lot of uh, men in politics in America who saw that, well, this is how the elites in Britain became wealthy and powerful, and we want to be wealthy and powerful. Uh, the opposition to this was always uh, Thomas Jefferson and the Jeffersonians. Uh, the proponents at that time was Alexander Hamilton, the America's first Treasury Secretary, was the chief proponent of this, and he was uh, sort of the intellectual, uh, intellectual uh, brains, really, of the Federalist Party, the opposing party to Jefferson. And the Jeffersonians looked at this, and they correctly stated that, uh, you know, we just fought a revolution against this system. Why would we want to adopt it here? And uh, that was the point they were making. And, uh, of course, the answer, if they, if they were to have been honest about it by the Hamiltonians, uh, they would have said, uh, they would have quoted Mel Brooks in the movie History of the World Part Two, where Mel, Mel Brooks plays the king of France, and he keeps saying over and over through the movie, it's good to be the king. And so uh, if you're on the paying side of a mercantilist empire, it's a bad deal. It might even be worth fighting a revolution to get rid of that. Uh, but if you're on the collecting side, it's good to be the king. And Hamilton and his cronies wanted to be the kings. Uh, and so they wanted to import this system, and the whole system was, was premised on the existence of a government-run bank so, sort of similar to the Bank of England. So it would have been the British system imported to America. Alexander Hamilton himself coined the phrase the American system to uh, describe this British system that he wanted to bring to America. And, uh, you know, of course, he grew up... Uh, as a teenager, he worked for uh, slave-owning molasses traders in, on St. Croix in the Caribbean. And that, that is sort of his educational background in economics. And, and so he observed how wealthy these men came as, became as a part of the British mercantilist system. And uh, he thought that was the route to wealth. He wasn't very well educated at all in economics. Uh, I don't think he ever even read The Wealth of Nations. Uh, and I, in my book, Hamilton's Curse, I quote William G Graham Sumner as saying the same thing. Sumner wrote a biography of Hamilton in 1905. Uh, and so he was, what he knew about economics, what little he knew, uh, I think he learned from sort of um, propaganda pamphlets that were written by uh, uh, people who worked for the British mercantilists 
uh, who, who spread propaganda in favor of protectionism and, and, and these other policies. But, uh, but it was his nemesis, Jefferson, who was well-educated, who did read The Wealth of Nations. If you, if you go into uh, uh, Monticello today, which is Thomas Jefferson's home in Virginia, uh, right by the front door, the first thing you see is a, a, a marble bust of uh, Turgot, the French finance minister, whose name is uh, upstairs in the Mises Institute in the library, uh, among you know the famous precursors of the Austrian school. And so it was Jefferson was well schooled in economics, and that's why he opposed the central bank. And so, well, here's what um, Murray Rothbard said about this. He wrote about this in in his book, The Mystery of Banking. He said, as soon as the revolution was over. Uh, Hamilton was a part of the, a political cabal uh, that was really headed by Robert Morris, who was probably the wealthiest man in America at the time. He was also a defense contractor during the, uh, the uh, Revolutionary War. He was a Philadelphia businessman. And here's what Rothbard said, that these people wanted, quote, I'm quoting, to reimpose in the new United States a system of mercantilism and big government similar to that in Great Britain against which the colonists had rebelled. The object was to have a strong central government, particularly a strong president or king as chief executive, built up by high taxes and heavy public debt. The strong government was to impose high tariffs to subsidize domestic manufacturers, develop a big navy to open up and subsidize foreign markets for American exports, and launch a massive system of internal public works. In short, the United States was to have a British system without Great Britain. And that was Murray Rothbard. And then he goes on to say, an important part of the Morris scheme, he calls this the Morris scheme, was to organize and head a central bank to provide cheap credit and expanded money for himself and his allies. The Bank of North America was deliberately modeled after the Bank of England. That was really the first central bank. It was called the Bank of North America. And it only lasted about a year because it, uh, its currency was he had a monopoly on currency, a legal monopoly on currency issue, and, but it was so uh, mistrusted that the currency became worthless in about a year, and it was privatized. Uh, but these people uh, never gave up. Um, uh, Rothbard refers to, quote, Morris's youthful disciple, Alexander Hamilton, and, and he was his youthful disciple. And, uh, and Hamilton was quite the... Uh, what would be the scientific term? The scientific term would be ass kisser, I think, <laughs> for uh, Alexander Hamilton. You know, he was at a young age, he was 20 years old, and he's George Washington's aide de camp in, uh, in the Revolutionary Army. And, uh, and near the end of the American Revolution, uh, he, when the, it was evident that the war was going to end, uh, uh, Hamilton writes a letter to Robert Morris, and the richest man in the country. And, uh, and so, uh, and what did he write in a letter? Well, he didn't know anything about economics and finance. And so he asked uh, uh, a man named Timothy Pickering, who, who would later become George Washington's Secretary of War, who was known to know a lot about finance at the time, uh, what can I read to learn at least the language of finance and economics? So Timothy Pickering gave him a few books, enough to allow him to write a 30-page letter to Robert Morris and he pretty much said in the letter, and I, I quote the letter in an article of mine that's in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, he pretty much said, uh, Dear Mr. Morris, I agree 100% with your economic plan for a central bank, corporate welfare, protectionist tariffs, and a big public debt. And so uh, that's, that's why I said the scientific term uh, would apply to, uh, to Hamilton all the way. And so, uh, so here's the richest man in America. Uh, the war is ending. And he has George Washington's top assistant writing him saying, after the war, we need to get all this done. We need to get all these things done. And so uh, Robert Morris writes George Washington and recommends when he's president, when George Washington became president after the war, and recommends Alexander Hamilton as treasury secretary. And uh, according to Ron Chernow, the Pulitzer Prize winning biographer of Hamilton, George Washington then turned to Hamilton and said, I didn't know you knew anything about finance. We never talked about it. Uh, but he appointed him as the first tre American Treasury Secretary because Robert Morris said so. And Robert Morris, after all, he must know something about money. He's the richest man in the country. And so, uh, so that's how he became first Treasury Secretary. Uh, this was uh, uh, very similar to today. You know, when's the last time you heard of a Treasury Secretary who was not the head of Goldman Sachs? Uh, so Robert Morris was the Goldman Sachs of the day, uh, who represented the Philadelphia and New York banking industry. And so he put his man, his puppet, became the first Treasury Secretary.
Well, here's what Ron Chernow actually says. He said, Hamilton brushed up on money matters and had Colonel Timothy Pickering send him some primers uh, to, to read. Uh, Hamilton sent a marathon letter to Morris that set forth a full-fledged system for shoring up American credit and creating a national bank. And so, so this laid out uh, this letter laid out their agenda. And the agenda was subsidize corporations directly, protectionist tariffs, a big public debt, and uh, a national a central bank to, to pay for it all. And the big public debt was closely linked to the idea of a bank. A uh, uh, central bank. Um, uh, Hamilton himself was a very Machiavellian in this, and the reason he gave for a, a large public debt being a virtue, he called it a blessing. That's why I called my book my book Hamilton's Curse. There's another book out called Hamilton's Blessing about the public debt being a blessing. Uh, why Hamilton thought it would be a blessing was that the wealthiest people of the country would own the government bonds, therefore they would become a powerful political lobbying force for higher taxes to make sure there was enough money in the treasury to pay off their bonds. And he wanted to link the wealthy to the government, just as today we link the poor to the government through welfare. He wanted them to be a permanent lobbying force because he believed the Constitution did not create nearly a big enough government. Uh, you have to understand that at the, at the American uh, Constitutional Convention, Alexander Hamilton, Hamilton appeared and he laid out the plan of the nationalists, as they were called. It was a permanent president who would appoint all the governors who would have veto power over all state legislation. So it would be a king, essentially, and, and there would be no such thing as federalism or states' rights. The, it would be a monopoly government in the nation's capital. Uh, and, and, of course, that's why the Jeffersonians said, well, the, sounds like the king of England. Uh, why would we want that? We just fought a revolution against that. Okay, and the, the, so the purpose of the central bank was to fund all this. And here's, um, and so the, so the, so I'll tell the story. Um, well, here's, here's what, uh, another thing that Hamilton had in mind. Um, this is a quote from Douglas Adair, and he was a, an editor of the Federalist Papers, which makes the case for the U.S. Constitution. So Douglas Adair in 1980, this is a 1980 edition of the Federalist Papers describing Hamilton's role in all of this. He says, uh, and I'm quoting, with devious brilliance, Hamilton set out by a program of class legislation to unite the propertied interests of the Eastern Seaboard into a cohesive administration party, that is a party of government. While at the same time he attempted to make the executive dominant over Congress by a lavish use of the spoils system. In carrying out his scheme, Hamilton transformed every financial transaction of the Treasury Department into an orgy of speculation and graft in which selected senators, congressmen, and certain of their richer constituents throughout the nation participated. That's his description of Hamilton as Treasury Secretary. He was building big government by using his post as a, as a patronage office to buy the allegiance of various members of Congress for his agenda of bigger government than the Constitution would allow. And so the, one of the first things Hamilton did was they, they nationalized um, the war debt. Okay, the states had financed, the individual states had financed the, the war through uh, tax collections and issuing debt. So there, there, were all, there was all these bonds that uh, many of them were held by Revolutionary War veterans who were paid in government bonds when they ran out of money. And so, and at the time, a lot of them were trading for as little as 2% uh, of par value. And so Hamilton and the insiders in the U.S. Congress passed a law saying that these bonds would be redeemed at a certain date at 100% par value. And so the insiders knew this, but this was before the internet, remember? This was way before the internet. And so, what happened was uh, the insiders, the political insiders, including Hamilton personally, hired uh, ships, stagecoaches, every means of transportation available at the time to go up and down the eastern seaboard of the United States to buy up all these bonds at 2 to 10% of face value because they and only they knew that in a couple of weeks they could turn around and sell, and, and sell these bonds back to the government at 100% of face value. Uh, here's how... There's a biography of Jefferson and Hamilton by Claude Bowers, uh, a famous uh, historian uh, uh, who explains what happens. Here's, 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 he's explaining this scene. Uh, 
Uh, he says, expresses with very large sums of money on their way to North Carolina were going for purposes of speculation in certificates. They splashed and bumped over wretched winter roads. Two fast-selling vessels chartered by a member of Congress who had been an officer in the war were plowing the waters southward on a similar mission. So there was this mad dash to uh, to go and buy up uh, uh, all the, these bonds from these unsuspecting bondholders. And they did. And uh, Bowers writes about how Sir, uh, Robert Morris himself made about $35 million at the time through this type arbitrage that happened. You know, talk about insider trading. This is, this is political insider trading, you know, the first big example of it. And so here's Jefferson observing all this. And at the same time, Hamilton is writing a big report to George Washington arguing that a bank run by politicians out of the nation's capital is constitutional. Jefferson uh, went back and, and said, well, the Constitutional Convention debated this and rejected the idea of a bank. And that would seem to be pretty conclusive evidence that it was not constitutional. It's not in the Constitution. It's not part of the delegated powers of the Constitution. Uh, Hamilton, would that, at that point, Alexander Hamilton invented the idea of implied powers of the Constitution. He said, yes, it's, there's no, it's not an explicitly delegated power to the central government, but if you read in between the lines, it's implied somehow. And uh, you know, Jefferson's up view was that if you read in between the lines, you'll see blank space. There's nothing, nothing there. He was, that was called strict constructionism, uh, and it still is. But, but Jefferson smoked out uh, Hamilton on this, of uh, why he wanted a bank here. And, uh, and we did get the bank. Uh, the two men wrote reports to George Washington uh, but the way we did get the first central bank, it was called the Bank of the United States, was that um, George Washington owned a lot of land in Virginia. It's known as Mount Vernon now, his property in, in uh, Virginia. And they were moving the national capital from New York to Virginia, Washington, D.C. And George Washington wanted the national capital to be adjacent to his property. And so they cut a deal. George Washington said, if you redraw the boundaries so that D.C. is adjacent to my property, I'll vote for the bank. And he did. So that's how we got the first bank of the United States. It wasn't on the strength of uh, the arguments of Alexander Hamilton. It was just uh, a real estate deal that benefited George Washington. And, and so, so that's how we got it. But, but here's how uh, Jefferson smoked out the purpose of this bank that Hamilton wanted. You know, this, this arbitrage opportunity, it was used to dish out special favors to members of Congress who would then vote for Hamilton's agenda of uh, corporate welfare, uh, subsidies for road and canal building companies, cheap credit for uh, businesses mostly in the Northeast, uh, protectionist tariffs that, that he wanted. They had to buy the support of Congress, and, and the, this arbitrage over the nationalization of the debt was their vehicle for buying votes. Uh, but but here's what uh, Jefferson recognized. Uh, well, Jefferson called it uh, Hamilton's, he said, Hamilton's financial system had two objects. And I'm quoting Thomas Jefferson here. First, as a puzzle to exclude popular understanding and inquiry. That is, it was so complicated sounding that the average person would have no way of understanding it. And that is certainly true today. And then secondly, as a machine for the corruption of the legislature. So he understood that what he was all about in, in advocating a bank is he wanted, uh, he wanted a, 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 a mechanism for corruption. Uh, here's another thing Jefferson said about Hamilton. He said, he avowed the opinion that man could be governed by one of two motives only, force or interest, self-interest. Force, he observed, in this country was out of the question. And the interest, therefore, of the members of Congress must be laid hold of to keep the legislature in unison with the executive. And with grief and shame, it must be acknowledged that his machine, political machine, he means, was not without effect. That even in this, the birth of our government, some members were found sordid enough to bend their duty to their self-interest and to look after personal rather than the public good. He's talking about the arbitrage and the money they made. And the big problem facing uh, Hamilton, said Jefferson, was that this was only a one-time scheme. This was only a one-time vote-buying scheme. What he really needed was a permanent engine of corruption because they nationalized the debt once. You can't nationalize it again. They already had it. You can't play this game over and over again to buy votes from a member of Congress. And so 
Here's what Jefferson said. Some engine of influence more permanent must be contrived. This engine was the Bank of the United States. So in uh, Jefferson's opinion, the whole case that uh, Hamilton was making for the first central bank, the Bank of the United States, was that it could be used as an engine of corruption. Uh, and then uh, later on, many years later, you know, uh, Hamilton died in 1804. And uh, in 1818, Jefferson wrote uh, an article uh, recalling uh, a dinner that he had with John Adams uh, and, and uh, Hamilton himself and, and a few other uh, you know, prominent people where John Adams, the former president John Adams, made the statement that he said, uh, he's talking about the British Constitution. He said, purge that Constitution of its corruption and give to its popular branch equality of representation and it would be the most perfect Constitution ever devised by the wit of man. So if you get rid of the corruption in the British government, it would be the most perfect constitution in the world, John Adams said. At that point, Hamilton interjects and, and, uh, and objects to this and said, no, he said, no, the corruption in Britain is a virtue, not a vice, because it's that corruption that keeps government growing and getting bigger. You need some corruption to have bigger government. Uh, he actually said that. You know, this, uh, in, in Jefferson, in this article, he says, I swear in the graves of my children that this is the true story. Uh, and, so, uh, uh, and, so, and so I think it's apparent, you know, the, uh, because the first bank of the United States was tremendously corrupt, as was the second bank of the United States. And, uh, and we, did get the, we did get the first bank of the United States. And uh, in the first five years, it created 72% price inflation. In the first five years, and it did, and it was used to uh, to influence politics, to an attempt uh, to institute politics, and it did so much of this. It created so much economic instability and price inflation that uh, Congress did not renew its twenty-year charter. It was given a twenty-year charter in 1781, and then uh, it was uh, became defunct. Uh, but then uh, the, um, the War of 1812 came, and so. In order to monetize the war debt, it was brought back in 1816. So we had the second bank in the United States. And so we're into the 19th century here, and we start the 19th century with government banking. So Ben Bernanke was dead wrong of, when he said he equated laissez-faire and 19th century banking policy. Uh, the second bank in the United States, here's Murray Rothbard's explanation of, how, of one of the driving forces for the, the recreation of the bank of the United States. Uh, Rothbard says this in his History of Money and Banking in the United States. The second bank in the United States was pushed through Congress, particularly by Secretary of the Treasury Alexander J. Dallas, a wealthy Philadelphia lawyer and close friend, counsel, and financial associate of Philadelphia merchant and banker Stephen Gerard, reputedly one of the two wealthiest men in the country. Gerard was the largest stockholder of the first bank in the United States, and during the War of 1812, Gerard became a very heavy investor in the war debt of the federal government. As a way to unload his public war debt, Gerard began to agitate for a new bank of the United States who he could sell his bonds to. And so that, that, that was one of the moving forces behind why we got the second bank of the United States. Nothing, you know, no market failure story was even attempted to be told about the second bank of the United States. And so we got this monster uh, back, uh, and so and this is 1816, and uh, who here knows the title of Murray Rothbard's doctoral dissertation at Columbia University? Uh, the Panic of 1819. And so uh, you don't have to be an econometrician to, to make the argument that causation equals, uh, uh, that correlation equals causation, but uh, but Rothbard explains why there is causation here, that the bank was brought back in 1816, inflated the currency, created a boom, and the boom busted in 1819. And so you had the first massive unemployment in, in American history in the cities, where you had, uh, he, he writes of how in Philadelphia, uh, the, uh, the employment went from... Uh, uh, 9,500 to 1,500 uh, people uh, during the Panic of 1819. So, and that was the first really large-scale unemployment. And so, the so the bank, the second bank in the United States, came off with a big bang, creating a boom and bust, and and price inflation at the same time, uh, roughly doubled the price level uh, in, in a couple of years, uh, with after the War of 1812 was concluded. Okay, so and, and people all over the country knew about this. 
And the, the, uh, the, so the Second Bank of the United States opened up branches, started opening up branches all over the place. And the people of Ohio were especially upset about this. Uh, they, they were especially upset about the fact that this, uh, this uh, corrupt machine was appearing in their state. And so uh, at one point, the, the Bank of the United States opened up two branches in Ohio, state of Ohio. The state of Ohio then imposed a $50,000 a year tax on each branch. And, uh, and this is where eventually the uh, Chief Justice of the of United States, John Marshall, uh, made this, a statement that the power to tax is the power to destroy in one of his, uh, one of his uh, uh, decisions. And what he was referring to is the power to tax the Bank of the United States is the power to destroy it. Marshall was a proponent of the Bank of the United States. He was uh, slavishly devoted to Hamilton and Hamilton's, uh, Hamilton's ideas and, and Hamilton's political agenda. He was a nationalist like, like Hamilton. And so, and of course, the people in Ohio said, well, yeah, that's right. That's, that's the whole purpose of this tax, to tax it out of existence, you know, shoo it away. And so the state of Ohio uh, attempted to uh, collect this tax, $100,000. So they sent an armed marshal to the Bank of the United States office w- with a big chest, you know, carrying a big hope chest you know, with them to put all the loot in. And he did. He crawled up over the counter uh, you know, with his guns on his, on his uh, hip and took $100,000 out of the vault and carried it off to the state treasury. And, uh, and this sort of thing led to lots of litigation. And, and, event, and the other states did the same thing. For example, uh, Indiana and Illinois amended their state constitutions to prohibit the Bank of the United States from operating there. North Carolina, Georgia, Maryland, Tennessee, and Kentucky imposed heavy taxes, just like Ohio did. And, and their purpose was to get rid of this this thing. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, this is a good example of how the, the, the central government sets itself up. They have this constitution, uh, but of course, the politicians who are appointed uh, to be black-robed deities I mean, oh, I mean, uh, Supreme Court justices. Sorry, uh, of course they always support the government, uh, and so John Marshall goes out there and says, uh, "Well, yeah, the Bank of the United States is constitutional. It's not unconstitutional." But in those days, um, we Americans didn't look at the Supreme Court justices as black-robed deities who would announce, like uh, like Moses carrying the the Ten Commandments from the mountain. Uh, you know, they didn't treat them like that. They treated them like just another gang of politicians. Uh, Andrew Jackson uh, uh, was president at the time, and he pretty much uh, said, uh, thanks for your opinion, John, but my opinion is different, and we have three branches of government, not one. We have the executive branch, which is me, the president. We have the Congress. They have equal say on constitutional matters, and then we have the, your judicial branch, and, and, and then we have the people of the states on top of that, and that was the thinking in America at that time, and so, uh, you know... <coughs> Uh, it, it wasn't written in stone. Uh, and so, uh, so of course, as a result, Jackson did uh, veto the rechartering of the Second Bank. Yeah, there was a famous battle. Uh, the, the, the best book on it is called uh, An- Andrew Jackson and the Bank Wars by Robert Remini. I guess I could uh, <coughs> print his name here. The, uh, That's uh, the the uh, author's name, Andrew Jackson and the Bank Wars. Um, and so, uh, and then here's here's what Jackson said in his veto. When he vetoed it, this is part of Andrew Jackson's veto of the Second Bank of the United States. Uh, you know, we're into the 1830s now in the 19th century. It says, it is to be regretted that the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes. Distinctions in society will always exist under every just government. Equality of talent, of education, or of wealth cannot be produced by human institutions, but every man is equally entitled to protection by law. But when the laws undertake to add to these natural and just advantages, artificial distinctions to grant titles, gratuities, and exclusive privileges to make the rich richer and the potent more powerful, the humble members of society who have neither the time nor the means of securing like favors to themselves have a right to complain of the injustice of their government. If government would confine itself to equal protection, it would be an unqualified blessing. In the act before me to recharter the Bank of the United States, there seems to be a wide and unnecessary departure from these just principles. 
And that's Andrew Jackson. So he, he was recognizing that the bank was being used uh, as a, an, an engine of corruption. Uh, and the bank proved it, uh, too. During the battle, the bank was financing the political careers of proponents of the bank. Uh, Daniel Webster, uh, I quote Daniel Webster, Webster as writing a letter to Nicholas Biddle, the head of the Bank of the United States, as saying, if you want me to continue my support of your bank in Congress, you better send me my stipend. So he was literally being paid. Henry Clay resigned as Secretary of War to be the general counsel for the Bank of the United States because he had $45,000 in personal debt in 1825. Forty forty five thousand dollars in eighteen twenty five. He was known as a big gambler, uh, Henry Cl Henry Clay. So in two years, he he made uh, more than forty five thousand dollars in legal fees from the from the Bank of the United States, being being their lawyer. And so uh, and so, and all of that proved to a lot of people that well, this is an engine of corruption. But that, of course, is exactly what what Hamilton wanted. Uh, that was, so he was doing exactly what he wanted to do. And so, so the bank was defunct, and we had this era from a, roughly the late 1830s until uh, the 1860s uh, with no central bank. Uh, sometimes uh, it's sometimes referred to as free banking. Uh, the government uh, um, deposit of uh, treasury of uh, revenues, tax revenues, it was called the sub-treasury system. And all during this time, uh, the Whig Party was created around the same time, right? the early 1830s, and one of their top objectives was to bring back the Bank of the United States. It always was. And in my writings of Lincoln, uh, on Lincoln, uh, I quote uh, 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 Michael Holt from the University of Virginia. He's a historian who wrote a big fat book, The History of the Whig Party. It's about this thick. And, and, he, and he says that uh, no member of the, of the Whig Party was a more vociferous uh, proponent of bringing back a central bank than was Abraham Lincoln. And he, he made stump speeches all the time for candidates who were running for office who were uh, central banking proponents. And, and in fact, Lincoln himself, uh, when he was in the uh, state legislature in Illinois, uh, there's a story about him told by David Donald. David Donald is a Pulitzer Prize winning biographer of Lincoln. He, he taught at Harvard for many years. He just retired a few years ago. Uh, David Donald, and his his book is called Lincoln, and uh, and one story he tells in, in in there is that in Springfield, Illinois, there was a law that had suspended specie payment, uh, and so uh, the Illinois banks could issue they could inflate, and this law was about to go out of existence on December thirty first, and so uh, if the legislature went home uh, January first, uh, now the banks were required. To, uh, to have gold and silver, mostly gold, uh, for, uh, and redeemable for currency that, that they had issued. And Lincoln and the Whigs wanted to prevent this. They, didn't want, they wanted to keep the suspension of specie payment in. They didn't want it, want it to end. And so the story David Donald tells is that um, uh, Abe Lincoln himself, who was, this is uh, in the 1830s, uh, he was already the leader of the Whigs in Illinois. Uh, he bolted for the door because if they couldn't vote to adjourn, uh, they couldn't adjourn. They had to have a quorum to vote on everything. And But the, uh, the Democratic Party had placed marshals at the door and locked the door, couldn't get out. So Abe Lincoln literally jumped out the window and uh, jumped out the window. And uh, David Donald said that uh, the Democrats then started calling him Link, uh, Leaping Lincoln. And, uh, and, uh, and his merry band of followers. And the other Whigs supposedly did the same thing. They jumped out the window. And uh, when I, I was in Springfield, Illinois, a couple years ago, and uh, the old state house is still there. It's a museum now. And so I walked over there to see, and that was a long drop. I, I saw the window he dropped out of uh, there. And it was a, but he was six foot five, so he probably could have probably hung by his fingers and, and dropped down and, and did it. But it, it tells you how, you know, even... Uh, early on in my in my book, The Real Lincoln, I quote Lincoln's speech when he first entered politics. Uh, I could paraphrase it. He says, "My politics are short and sweet, like the old woman's dance." And he said, "I'm in favor of a high protectionist tariff, uh, a bank, and subsidies for an internal improvements. That is, uh, corporate welfare for railroad companies. Uh, it was called internal improvements, and that's it. That's what he said. That's why. That's why I'm in politics." But the bank was the key. The bank was what to pay for all this, this stuff. And so, uh, and, and of course, Murray Rothbard explains uh, what suspension of specie payment means, the thing that uh, the Whigs, like Lincoln, spent their lives trying to get in the 19th century. 
And here's what he says in uh, uh, What Has Government Done to Our Money? The bluntest way for government to foster inflation is to grant banks the special privilege of refusing to pay their obligations while yet continuing in their operation. While everyone else must pay their debts or go bankrupt, the banks are permitted to refuse redemption of their receipts, and that is redemption for gold, at the same time forcing their debtors to pay when their loans fall due. So you have to pay up when your loan falls due, but if you go to the bank, the same bank, and say, I'd like gold for my money, they say, get lost. You know, the hell with you. Uh, a more ac uh, the usual name for this is a suspension of specie payments. A more accurate name, says Rothbard, would be, quote, license for theft. For what else can we call a government permission to continue business without fulfilling one's contract? Okay, so, so when you put your money in the bank, the bank says, we'll give you gold when you want your money back. And then a year later, the government says, oh, we're going to suspend specie payment. And the bank says, no, we're not going to give you your gold, the gold that you gave us for this currency, for these pieces of paper, you know, license for theft. And that's the sort of thing um, that uh, Lincoln and the Whigs fought for. And so, uh, and so by the time you get to the 1860s, um, uh, uh, we, we didn't get, uh, someone answer that phone, please. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, by the time you get to the 1860s, uh, none of this had succeeded. The Jeffersonians had thwarted all of this. Uh, president after president after president had vetoed banking bills, tariff bills, uh, 1857 was the high watermark of free trade in America. The tariff rate was as low as it ever was in the 19th century. There was no central bank. There, uh, there was no uh, federal subsidies for railroads or anybody else. There had been some state subsidies, but they were all such disasters that every state had amended its constitution to prohibit the use of tax funds for the corporations to do anything. Uh, and that all changed in, during the Civil War when... Uh, uh, Lincoln, uh, the Lincoln administration uh, enacted the National Currency Acts and the Legal Tender Acts. They created the greenbacks uh, that were not backed by gold a a at the time, or, or silver for that matter, at the time, allowed them to print money. During the Civil War, the price level doubled roughly in the northern states. In the southern states, did the same thing, but on a much greater scale. Inflation was like 2,000% a year in the, in the southern states during the Civil War. Uh, and so... Uh, in the legal tender acts, uh, you know, m monopolized the currency. They, they imposed a special tax on any existing competing currencies. And the Secret Service was created to police that. The origins of the Secret Service was to police uh, uh, counterfeiting, uh, you know, competition. In other words, for, for the greenbacks uh, that were created. And so uh, we didn't get a, a central bank per se, but we had, we moved a, a big step in the direction of the nationalization of the money supply, nevertheless. And so, you know, it's, it's another, yet another reason why Bernanke doesn't know what he's talking about when he refers to the, the 19th century as some sort of laissez-faire period in, in banking. And um, here's, uh, I'll read to you what a few people said about this. This, this was a huge victory for the, the Hamiltonians who, who had morphed into uh, the Whigs and then the Republicans by the 1860. Uh, and here's what, um, let's see, please one. Let's see. Maybe one more quote here. Yeah. Well, maybe it's of course, but the, the Republicans were ecstatic about this. I can read you one quote from some of the ecstatic Republicans. Oh yeah, uh, there's there's a historian named Heather Cox Richardson. She wrote a book called "The Greatest Nation on the Earth." Uh, yeah, how arrogant is that? It's about it's about America during the Civil War years and the, the, the domestic policy during the Civil War, greatest nation on the earth. Uh, she quotes John Sherman. Senator John Sherman was the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. So he was very instrumental in getting the National Currency Acts passed. He was the brother of General Sherman, the, the military general. They're, they're both from Ohio. And here's what he said that was the, the Republican Party's objective with the National Currency Acts. He says it was, quote, to nationalize as much as possible, even the currency, so as to make men love their country before their states, all private interests, all local interests, all banking interests, the interests of individuals, everything should be subordinate now to the interest of the government. 
That's Senator John Sherman, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee and uh, uh, the most powerful man in Washington on uh, economic matters during the Lincoln administration. And he, of course, was still in the Senate in 1890 when they named the antitrust law after him. So he was uh, he was there quite a long time. Uh, okay, and so there was um, the, an opponent. There was a, a Democrat named Lazarus Powell from Kentucky, a member of Congress. And here's what he said of the National Currency Act. The result of this legislation is to utterly destroy the rights of the states. It is asserting a power which is carried out to its logical result would enable the National Congress to destroy every institution of the states and cause all power to be concentrated here in Washington, D.C. And, of course, Alexander Hamilton, were he alive, would have said, well, sure, that's the whole point of this, uh, is centralized power. Uh, the same with the income tax. When the income tax came along in 1913, it, it, it you know gave the, the the government of Washington so much money that the the states became just mere appendages because they could easily buy off uh, any any state government uh, with with all that money. Uh, the New York Times on March 9, 1863. Uh, wrote a, an article about the Legal Tender Act. They said this, the Legal Tender Act and the National Currency Bill crystallized a centralization of power such as Hamilton might have eulogized as magnificent. So that was always the game, to centralize power in Washington. That's how we got Hamilton's scheme of, uh, 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 we don't have a permanent president, but they're all pretty much the same anyway. Whether it look, whether the, the figurehead is Barack Obama or George W. Bush, they pretty much all work for Goldman Sachs and, and, and various other special interests as far as that. That's who they always put in charge of the money anyway. And so, uh, so it doesn't really matter. So we, we, got, we, we eventually did get Hamilton's highly centralized monopoly government and the, and the nationalization of the currency uh, really was it. Uh, now, so so, what was the effect of these national currency acts? We did still have the gold standard after after the Civil War, and uh, there there were periodic suspensions of specie payment. Uh, there were uh, there were state governments that imposed all sorts of regulations, like branch banking restrictions on banks. That 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 created problems uh, a lot, also. So there was not only federal regulation of banking; there was state regulation of banking, and. Um, there were some economists, some pretty prominent economists, who evaluated this whole system, the National Currency Acts, and, and what they did uh, eventually. And this was, and Anna Schwartz was one of them. You know, the, uh, Anna Schwartz was, you know, one of the most famous monetary economists of the 20th century. She just died a couple of years ago, um, if, if not a, a year ago or so. It's pretty recent. And she wrote, she co-authored the famous book with Milton Friedman, A Monetary History of the United States. Uh, but there was a, a book of readings on monetary history that Anna Schwartz was the principal author of this one article. And uh, this whole system that was enacted in the 1860s uh, until the Fed was created in 1913, uh, here's how they characterized it. As it was characterized by, quote, monetary and cyclical instability, four banking panics, frequent stock market crashes, and other financial disturbances. That's, that's how they described it. So in other words, it, it behaved just like uh, what, when we had the Bank of the United States, the first Bank of the United States, and the second Bank of the United States. It created it. gave boom and busts, price inflation, stock market crashes. Uh, and so we had the same thing with government regulation of banking in the, 19, in the late 19th century, even without the Fed, as far as that's concerned. Okay, and so... Uh, uh, well, time is running out, but that's that's sort of my one-hour rundown of 19th century banking and explanation of why Ben Bernanke is full of it when he says uh, laissez-faire banking was say, was uh, improved upon by the creation of the Fed in 1913. And uh, I think time is about up. I have uh, oh no, we have time. I'm I'm looking at the wrong thing. I think we have time for Q and A. Then uh, that's all I wanted to say. And if, if anybody has questions about anything. Uh, I can't answer questions about anything, but you can ask them. You know, uh, yeah, so, I, I just want to say that Anna Schwartz is a liar. I thought, I, heard, I thought she passed away. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, well, I'm glad to hear that. That's, uh, I think somebody told me she died. That's, uh, may, maybe it's they told me she retired and thought she was dead because she retired. I don't know. That's, uh, that's, uh, okay. Well, that's pretty good. She, uh, I like the Anna Schwartz. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Yeah. I was wondering if you could comment on the book in general and kind of if you like the way that they set forth the history, if you found any problems with them. Uh, I read it uh, quite some time ago, and uh, I thought it was, it was a little too uh, conspiracy theory oriented, even for me. Uh, and, and there were some bad economics in it. I, I would rely more on uh, Murray Rothbard's uh, monetary history of the United States. I think he he knew orders of magnitude more than the, about this than the author of the Creature from Jekyll Island, even though he he probably had some things right. Uh, the Mises Institute has had two uh, Fed conferences on Jekyll Island. And including one in the room where the Fed was created, and they have the pictures of all these guys who are the conspirators. Uh, uh, and uh, and you walk into the room, and, and you can swear that the eyeballs are moving back and forth when you see all these big <laughs> portraits of these people. And there's a big conference room there. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't use it in a, as a as a textbook in a classroom. You know, you could read it if you want, but I, there there are a lot better uh, sources of the origins of the Fed than. Uh, uh, than that one because there's some bad economics in there that I didn't like. So that doesn't. But any book I read, though, I don't. I don't expect every book to be perfect. I read, you know, a lot of the hi economic history research I do. I force myself to read dozens of really bad books, but there's always some good information in them. It's well documented, footnoted, and and you can make use of it and you can learn things about it. And uh, and you can and if you understand economics, you can. Uh, you can interpret some of these historical events differently from these his historical authors sometimes. So I'm not saying you shouldn't read that book, but uh, it's not one of my favorites on that uh, that whole topic. I think someone up here had their hand up next. Oh, yeah, uh, I, was, um, I was just, just I can't help but think uh, Alexander Hamilton. What was his idea with Big Gummer and just wanted to Big Gummer and Big Gummer and interested uh, uh, the, 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 His question was, why did Alexander Hamilton want Big Government? Uh, well, what, one reason was his financial benefactors wanted it. They wanted a central bank that would subsidize their businesses, and he was their emissary uh, to the government. And uh, and he became a he was a lawyer. And, uh, and and the way it usually works is, you know, once you leave the government, your law firm gets all kinds of business from those those companies, and you become very wealthy. And so uh, and so that's that's you know financial interest right there. And uh, Hamilton also uh, talked a lot about imperial glory. He wanted to invade France, for example, and he said it would it would it would give America imperial glory. And Hamilton, you know, of course, Jefferson was terrified at this because he knew that uh, all war was a a, a a waste of blood and treasure. Uh, and, and so, and here he had Hamilton wanting a central bank to finance more wars. Uh, that's why, for example, when Jefferson was president. And the British started kidnapping American sailors and stealing American ships to help themselves out with their, their war with France. Uh, Jefferson had uh, chose the lesser of two evils. He put a trade embargo on because the alternative was another war with England. And he thought a war with England would be an unmitigated disaster, whereas a trade embargo is just a, a disaster, an economic disaster. And, uh, and he had to know that there would be uh, uh, a lot of cheating on the trade embargo anyway. But uh, but but he was so anti-war that that's what he did, and so but Hamilton wanted he wanted war, and you need big government for war. You need a lot of money for wars. He, he really wanted to invade France, and uh, and they had they did a, had to work very hard to to avoid a, a war with France right after the war with England uh, occurred, and so he was quite the egomaniac. And I thought uh, imperial glory was what he talked about a lot. He complained uh, constantly to George Washington that we need a government of more energy. And if you read the biography of him by William Graham Sumner, he was the type of person that uh, did not, uh, either did not understand or did not like the fact that uh, the invisible hand worked pretty well. Uh, he thought that he had to have his hand in everything in the U.S. economy or else it wouldn't work. He was that type of person and he had the authority. He was treasury secretary. And so, uh, so he was sort of a compulsive central planner uh, in terms of his mentality if, if, you, uh, if you read about him. Um, yes, sir. I think he had his hand up in the back. On the opposite extreme from the Jekyll Island book, there's Grider's uh, Temple. Yeah. Which, um, which one thing I find interesting about that is he takes a line from the past uh, specifically for difficulty implementing their sort of rule-based system, but fails to take it in the path for difficulty of successfully successful discretionary lines that he calls. Yeah. Uh, maybe he comments on from which these writers' books. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty good summary of it, I, I think. Secrets of the Temple, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I read it a long time ago when it came out, uh, but uh, I don't think, yeah, that's that's pretty good. That's a pretty good summary. I would, I would agree with you there. Uh, yes. yes, sir. In the 19th century, with all the meddling from the government in the first and second national banks, how quickly after those things resolved or after they were removed did the market stabilize and currency stabilize? Um, well, they did stabilize pretty fast. After the panic of 1819, um, you know, the, the Fed, the... Uh, the um, well, I won't use that. But the period when when Al, when Jackson vetoed the rechartering rechartering of the Second Bank of the United States, uh, both uh, Richard Timberlake is uh, you know one of the few people who've written a, a treatise on monetary history of the United States. There's Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz. There's Murray Rothbard's History of Money and Banking, and there's Richard Timberlake's book. And that's really the only three treatises there are on uh, the monetary history of the United States. Uh, um, Alan Meltzer has written the history of the Fed, but it's not a monetary history of the United States, you know, comprehensive. But Timberlake, uh, in his book, says that that period uh, from the end of the Second Bank of the United States until Lincoln's introduction of the National Currency Acts was the most stable monetary system America ever had, even though it wasn't perfect. And Jeffrey Hummel says the same thing. Jeffrey Hummel is the uh, historian who's written a lot on uh, banking history. Uh, he had he had a, a real good article in the Journal of Libertarian Studies some years ago on the, on this period of banking, that he writes he sort of repeats it in his book. He has a book called uh, "Emancipating Slaves and Slaving Free Men," which is about the Civil War, the American Civil War. But he has a big section on banking history in there that's drawn from his earlier publications. And so these are two pretty good monetary historians who make a a, a good case that. It wasn't a perfect monetary system, but it's probably the most stable monetary system that has ever existed in America. Now, the critics of this era say that uh, 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 grossly exaggerate what were called wildcat banks. There were banks that said, well, yeah, we'll redeem your, the, our currency in gold, uh, but you have to go to the branch bank out in Skunk Guts, Alabama to, uh, to get it. And this would be out in the middle of nowhere where only a wildcat would live you know, a mountain lion. And, but, but of course, people are not that stupid. If they say, you could, yeah, we'll give you gold for, your, for, for the pieces of paper. We'll give you your gold back. But you have to travel 500 miles through the jungle to get it. Uh, you know, they, were, they weren't that important. Uh, they, they existed. There were con artists who tried to set up banks like that. That's true. But it's a minor thing. It was a minor thing. But the, uh, the, the critics of uh, free banking always grossly exaggerate wildcats. They'll just say, didn't you ever hear of wildcat banking? As though, as though that existed everywhere. But it wasn't. It was a very minor thing, and so and it's really kind of dishonest for them to say that. Uh, but I think Timberlake and Hummel make a better case that this was uh, sta more stable than uh, than any other system. It wasn't perfect, but it was pretty stable. Yes, sir. Mercantilism and fascism. Uh, well, I think mercantilism uh, uh, more, sort of morphed into fascism. There's, a, uh, there's an author named Michael Lind who, uh, who wrote a book of essay, edited a book of essays on economic nationalism. And he actually says this, uh, but he, he doesn't even realize that he's, he's, he's explaining how um, the mercantilist ideas of Alexander Hamilton eventually migrated to Europe and Japan. He even mentioned Japan and influenced the Japanese and, and German policymakers in the early 20th century. <laughs> and so here, Michael Lind is a defender of economic nationalism and, uh, and the, the Hamiltonian agenda. But in his book, he, he doesn't recognize it. He says it. He lays out you know, the names of the people who advocated these ideas and brought them to Europe. Uh, of course, they started in Europe, then they came to the United States, and then they went back to Europe because of Hamilton's influence and prominence, and also Japan. They became popular in Japan, sort of central planning. And so, uh, you know, economic fascism basically was uh, private property and private enterprise was permitted, but it was heavily controlled and regimented by the state so that it would only serve purposes that would uh, serve the state. Uh, mercantilism wasn't that extreme in central planning. It was pretty much a system of subsidies. Uh, but it wasn't central planning. It wasn't the king didn't uh, say, uh, no, sorry, you can't make soap. We want you to grow wheat instead or something like that. Uh, but that's what fascism was. It was You could have private enterprise, but it was only to serve whatever Hitler or Mussolini wanted it to do, to produce. Uh, 
if they want to produce tanks and, and, and bomber aircraft, that's what you would produce with your manufacturing business. The mercantilism wasn't, wasn't quite like that. Uh, but there is similarities. Uh, yes, sir. Um, when Hamilton made the argument that corruption fuels the government, and yeah. good, besides his own arrogance, besides the profit, did he try to make the argument that government, big government is good for society? Oh, yeah, he thought, uh, he thought the, uh, uh, Al, the question is, uh, did, did Hamilton think that big government was good for society? Um, well, he, he was uh, probably as instrumental as anyone in uh, getting the Constitutional Convention going to uh, uh, where the, uh, the states seceded from the original Constitution. They seceded from the Articles of Confederation, which he had condemned as too weak because they did not give the federal government taxing power at all. All the taxes came from the states. And so uh, at the Constitutional Convention, he wanted a king, a permanent president, as I said. And when he didn't get it, he stormed out of there. And uh, when the Constitution was finally ratified, he denounced it as a frail and worthless fabric. Those, those are his words. And so even though he was the author of the Federalist Papers, and he said all sorts of nice things in the Federalist Papers, he, uh, he spent the rest of his life uh, trying to subvert the Constitution. And I, and, I, and I describe how he did that in my book, Hamilton's Curse. And so he thought the government needed to be much bigger and more powerful. He, uh, he wanted a standing army. Uh, Jefferson did not. Jefferson fought him tooth and nail over a standing army because Jefferson understood, as, er as everyone did at that time, that the standing armies of Europe were always used to intimidate the citizens. It wasn't, they weren't defending them against invaders. They were intimidating the citizens to, uh, to pay taxes. They were essentially an army of tax collectors. And, uh, and that, that, it convinced me that that was true of Hamilton when I read, when I, I read about what he did during the Whiskey Rebellion. There were uh, farmers in, in Pennsylvania that were growing wheat, and Hamilton, as Treasury Secretary, was instrumental in putting a special tax on wheat. And uh, these farmers were uh, 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 making whiskey out of wheat, out of grain, because they decided it was too too heavy and cumbersome to grow wheat and transport it across the state to Philadelphia and New York and sell it there from western Pennsylvania. And so they made whiskey instead. And then there was a special, a special tax on whiskey, the whiskey tax. And they thought of their being discriminated against, so they revolted. Hamilton talked George Washington into conscripting Getting, getting governors to conscript 15,000 men to ride up to Western Pennsylvania to put down the, the Whiskey Rebellion. It was called the Tax Rebellion. And uh, in Claude Bauer's book about this, the officers were all bondholders from the Eastern Seaboard, but the soldiers were conscripts. So they went up, uh, and Hamilton himself rode there, up there, and he became, they, they finally rounded up about two dozen tax protesters made them walk clear across from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia in the winter, some of them with bare feet, and they put them on trial with Hamilton as the judge. He decided he wanted to hang them. George Washington pardoned all of them. And so uh, the tax protesters won the tax protest. They didn't pay the tax and they didn't go to jail. Uh, but that's what convinced me that uh, the reason why Ham Hamilton wanted a standing army was a standing army of tax collectors just as existed during the, the American colonies. That was one of the big complaints the, in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he has sent swarms of officers to eat out our sustenance. That's what Hamilton wanted. He wanted swarms of officers to, to collect all of his taxes. He imposed a, a personal property tax that created the Shays Rebellion in New England. Uh, uh, you know, the whiskey tax created another, another tax rebellion. And so he was, he was a, uh, a hyper energetic statist uh, who didn't believe anybody could get along without his control and, and, and his finger being on their, their, their behavior. And he needed a lot of tax. He was a Machiavellian, too. There's even a book on Hamilton called The American Machiavelli uh, about him. And so that, that's who he was. And, uh, and he was so, and he must, he was very brilliant. He must have been sort of a Svengali type character because. Uh, I've read what John Marshall says about him, and, it, and it's a, lot of the, a lot of John Marshall's writings, the, the Chief Justice, sound like a 13-year-old girl writing about her first boyfriend. Uh, and it's, uh, it's kind of sickening. And uh, even John, John Marshall's famous uh, statement on the constitutional, constitutionality of the Bank of the United States, the big passages of it are verbatim from Alexander Hamilton's report on, on the bank to George Washington. They take the exact same words. Uh, in, in both things.
And so he was really slavishly devoted to it, his agenda. And uh, that's why uh, there's a good book, Ranks American Presidents, by Ivan Eland. It's called Recarving Rushmore. And he gives John Adams a very, very low ranking among all the presidents um, for two reasons. He, he's, he signed the, the Sedition Act, which made free speech illegal in America, and he appointed John Marshall as Chief Justice. And so uh, Ivan Eland says, for those two reasons, John Adams should be like number 48 or something of all the president, way down there in president. Um, let's see, I think we're about out of time. It's uh, 2.30. <laughs>